Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing a story for the New Republic about um, about sort of this state of of, of the, the, the national discussion about race, and part of that I'm looking at the men's rights movement and some of the stuff that's been discussed um, about rape within that community. Right. right. So I had talked with Paul, and he suggested that I um, I talk with you. Yeah. And so, so I looked at your your website some, and um, I'm just hoping you could tell me. Actually, first of all, just tell me a little bit about how you how you came to learn about and and be involved in the men's rights movement. Um, I actually just kind of stumbled on it by accident, and uh, started. Uh, it was sort of one of those things that. Um, something really clicked in a lot of the articles that I was reading um, that, that just seemed to be pointing at a lot of double standards and a lot of uh, sort of systemic inequalities that disadvantage men. And, and uh, so I, I, I did a lot of reading and a lot of talking about it for a while. And uh, then, you know, I, I moved province and... and uh, and was working all the time for a while um, to pay off some debts and got out of it. And then when I got, uh, when I started dating my current uh, boyfriend, um, he was going through some of the same uh, problems that a lot of men go through uh, as far as, you know, being denied access to your kids and stuff like that. And uh, so I just started discussing it online again. And, and then when I started getting accused by people of uh, being a man, because no woman would ever think this way, um, I just kind of figured, okay, I'm just going to put my face out there and do some videos just to kind of put that myth to rest, and, and then it just sort of snowballed. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of uh, I wasn't necessarily looking to be as involved as I am, um, but I've, I've kind of just been um, sort of... The situation has carried me further than I, than I maybe uh, had in, initially intended to go, so... So, so what were some of the specific things that you said that made people say, oh, hey, you couldn't possibly be a woman? Um, you know, things like uh, yeah, women can be violent in relationships. A woman hitting first uh, is not necessarily preemptive self-defense. Uh, sometimes she's just mad and wants to control a guy. Uh, you know, I've witnessed this myself, right? Uh, or she's jealous or whatever. There are, you know, men and women have pretty much the same reasons for hitting each other. And, uh, you know, so me saying something like that, uh, or me even speaking from a pro-male perspective on anything that could be construed as a gendered issue, um, you know, I, I would just, they, they just could not believe a woman would think the way I think. Mm-hmm. And so since you started, um, since you started posting videos online and writing about this stuff online, what has the reaction been like? Um, from feminists, I, I, I got a lot of, uh, of criticism and, uh, and, you know, some trolling and, um, you know, vague, vaguely threatening or menacing, uh, messages or comments, things like that. Uh, from men, it's just been overwhelmingly supportive, uh, unless they're male feminists, right? Um, I probably get 10 or 15 thank yous in my inbox. Just thank you for doing what you do in my inbox every day. So, I mean, there's just, this is part of the reason why uh, I've sort of committed to being really, really involved in this is because I think that there's, you see a need and you, you figure you should, you know, step in there. Somebody needs to step in and it's looking like I'm the right person for whatever reason, so. Mm -hmm. And so where have you been speaking besides the videos that you post? I saw that you did some, you, you talked at the university. Um, yeah, I spoke at Ryerson University in Toronto uh, just a week or so ago, and uh, I also have spoken at the University of Montana, Montana State University in Bozeman, I think that's the, the one, okay. um, and uh, I'm scheduled to speak in New Hampshire um, on the 21st and the 22nd of this month and then Wisconsin in April and... Uh, is that University of New Hampshire? Uh, it's actually not at a university, it's actually at a libertarian forum, so... Well, and 
uh, I spoke at uh, for the New York State uh, Libertarian Party's convention last year as well. So um, it seems like um, that it, even though I, I don't think that this movement is is aligned with libertarianism, they seem to be very open-minded when it comes to new ideas, and they seem to be the only sort of uh, political party or political philosophy uh, that doesn't deal specifically with gendered stuff that has shown any interest in hearing what I have to say. So I'm definitely, you know, any opportunity to speak anywhere is something I'm going to jump on, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and how, so, how did it go at um, at Ryerson? Was there was there some controversy surrounding that? I saw headlines, but I don't know that I actually read. Oh, okay. Yeah, there there was some controversy. It was a lot less than it, than uh, has uh, been in the past. Uh, uh, Cafe, the Canadian Association for Equality, sponsored my event, and they've sponsored other events, other lectures at uh, the University of Toronto. And those sparked protests, uh, illegal protests. People were masked, uh, which uh, is against the law in Canada. Uh, some of them were assaulting the police. They pulled fire alarms, uh, stuff like that. And uh, we didn't have any of that uh, at my event. In fact, uh, what has happened the last two events, uh, Dr. Miles Groth's talk at the University of Toronto a while ago and my own, is that you do have some protesters out there, but they're specifically protesting something else. In Miles Groth's case, uh, the feminist protesters were protesting uh, a University of Toronto professor who had said, uh, of English literature, who had said he doesn't um, include uh, books written by women in his syllabus or whatever because he doesn't relate to them. And so he teaches, he, he teaches what he knows. And there were, you know, huge screams of outrage over that. And, uh, and so they protested that. So I think they realized, and at my, in my case, they were protesting uh, Russia's treatment of gays. Okay. Okay. And so what that tells me is that, and exactly at the exact same time, you know, right when my event's starting, right when Miles Groth's event is starting, uh, they're having a protest over something else, um, is that they realize that protesting our events draws attention to our events. But if they protest something else, they'll pull, pull media attention away from... So they've kind of uh, got us set on, instead of angry obstruction and, and protests, they're just like, if we just ignore them and try and uh, draw attention away from them, uh, maybe they'll go away. So. Mm -hmm. And what did you talk about at Ryerson? Ironically, I talked about uh, feminist censorship of men's issues primarily, uh, men's issues awareness. So um, it was uh, uh, it was it was sort of a multifaceted talk, um, but uh, that basically that uh, feminism seems to want to have a monopoly on discussion of gender issues, and uh, they they really object when those issues are looked at out from outside a feminist perspective uh, without using the feminist lens as they call it and so yeah they they have actually uh, done a lot of uh, they've, they've made a lot of attempts to censor any kind of discussion online of those issues um, I think Facebook once feminist trainers uh, managed to uh, Facebook's executive you know they, they basically agreed to allow feminist trainers to train their their community moderators or, or whatever you want to call it, community standards people, to spot misogyny and remove it. And uh, some, some of the material uh, that was being posted to certain Facebook groups was indeed misogynistic and promoted violence against women and, and was really, really nasty. But some of the things that started being pulled down as violations of community standards after these feminists went in and trained uh, the staff, were government-provided statistics on domestic violence uh, showing that women hit men about as much as men hit women. So, you know, and basically saying domestic violence, women are half the problem. Um, because that is misogynistic too, right? You know, actually addressing the fact that women are half of the perpetrators of domestic violence is supposedly misogyny. So. 
And so, so um, did you talk about ed- ed rape or, um, or date rape on campus? Um, I, I really didn't talk about uh, that during that particular talk. I've spoken about it and, and written about it uh, prior. I mean, one of the, one of the big uh, crazy things that, that isn't actually uh, public knowledge is that about uh, in the U.S., about 40% of the, I guess, if you have the same definition, um, you know, for everybody... 40% of the rapes committed in 2009 were committed by women on men, right? This is according to the Centers for Disease Control and uh, their National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. Now, the reason why uh, nobody knows this is because even though the, I, the definitions in the, the report were identical, uh, other than, you know, who's, who's, whether the perpetrator has a tab A or a slot B, I guess you could say, um, they were called something different. Um, pe- rape was penetration of the victim, and, uh, and then the predominant method by which a man would be forced into sex by a woman was called made to penetrate, and it was considered other sexual violence. And so, and they did this specifically so that men's experience of uh, coerced or forced sex would not be captured in the numbers for rape. And uh, so, I mean, you're basically looking at, um, and this is another feminist thing, it was feminist uh, Mary Koss who basically consulted with the CDC on those definitions. And she feels it's inappropriate to consider as rape men's experience of unwanted sex. Um, with a woman, right, with a female partner. And so basically it's, it's another double standard and it's really erasing uh, a whole bunch of female perpetrators and male victims from our understanding of sexual violence and, and coerced sex. Um, you know, like really, you wake up in the morning with no memory if you're a woman and, you know, evidence that you've had sex and you automatically, you know, think... I've been raped, right? If you're a man and you wake up in the same condition, right? You basically uh, say, oh man, I'll never get that drunk again. And, you know, dust yourself off and you know, rub a little dirt in it and, and move on because nobody's going to take you seriously if you were to ever uh, even imply that you were forced into sex or you were taken advantage of by a woman. So... Sounds like you're saying that um, that sort of um, ignoring or diminishing male victims of sexual assault is one of the problems with um, the way we talk about rape in America. Is that would that be? Oh, it's 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 one of the huge problems too. What what it does because you know like I don't think necessarily that the way we treat uh, rape uh, you know as you know of women as you know sort of worse than death, um, worse than murder and sort of uniquely heinous crime, right? I, I don't think that that's necessarily healthy, uh, especially I don't think it's healthy for women. I don't think that it's healthy for somebody who's experienced that to be told by the culture that, yep, you might as well off yourself right now because there's no getting over it. What happened to you um, is so horrible that, you know, if you ever recover, which is doubtful, right, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's a healthy way to approach it. So I don't necessarily want to approach the issue of sexual violence against men and that, you know, equalize it in that way and, and have that kind of rhetoric attached to it. But one of the biggest problems that, that I have uh, found when discussing sexual violence online is, is this sort of myth that 99% of all rapists are men and, uh, you know, feminist sort of narratives on it is that it men raping women is sort of an, it's on a continuum of normal sexual behavior for men in the culture, uh, that, you know, that basically it's, it's just on a scale of rapiness, male sexuality, and, and ignoring the fact that women do it too, and in almost equal, uh, prevalence, right, that you ignore, you basically attach a behavior that would be more appropriately considered pathological 
and um, and sort of a cluster B personality disorder kind of behavior, you know, of a small number of men, you attach it to the concept of masculinity, right? Rape is not a pathology in in feminist size. It's male. It's it's a male behavior. It's masculinity is to blame. And it's really sad because only about four to six percent of men ever rape anyone, right? And most of these men have some serious issues with, you know, personality disorders or they were uh, abused uh, by women in their childhood, things like that. So to, to just suggest that it's like a component of masculinity within the culture uh, is, is essentially is vilifying all men everywhere. So, um, to understand, do you think feminists are suggesting that that all men would rape if they got the chance, or all men are... Um, you know, actually, uh, I, I have heard feminists suggest that just that. Um, Jessica Valenti is, is uh, very much, uh, she has come out and said that what terrifies her is that rape is so normalized that even otherwise nice guys would do it if they could, if they had the opportunity, right? And she's the founder of the blog Feministing. She's the author of Full Frontal Feminism, right? She's, she's you know, she's very, very well known. And she, she comes out and says this, and it's not only uh, extremely bigoted, but it's demonstrably false. If 94% of men never, ever rape, I mean, men have opportunities all the time. Right, and if ninety-four percent of them never ever take advantage of those opportunities, then you know what she's saying is is not just false, but it's it's hateful. Mm-hmm. And so, so do you think? What, so what, okay, well, let me ask you: What are some other other than sort of suggesting that that sexual violence is just an inherent part of the culture and ignoring male victims. What are some other big problems with the way America talks about rape? Um, I think that one, one, of the, the real, one of the biggest problems is that uh, there's just this sort of hysteria around it. Um, you know, that it, it's impossible to have a calm, reasoned, rational discussion about rape. Uh, you know, it, it's it's impossible to do that about sexual violence because the moment that you say something that that even rubs somebody the wrong, or that they can even twist uh, into something that will rub them the wrong way, um, especially if that person is a feminist, you know, then all of a sudden the entire media blows up, right? And everybody's yelling and screaming and furiously tweeting and and writing angry. Uh, polemics and uh, calling for people to be fired and you know I mean look look at James Taranto I mean within a day of him writing a Wall Street Journal article uh, about how it's a double standard that if two people are drunk and they mutually agree to have sex the man is automatically a rapist and the woman is automatically a victim right they're equally drunk and they equally participated in a mutually consensual act of reckless sex, and yet the man is, uh, is he actually, her drunkenness absolves her of any responsibility for her decisions. And his drunkenness is an aggravating factor that, uh, that imposes more culpability on him, right? He's more culpable be- because he was drunk, and he's more culpable even, again, because she was drunk, right? So basically, what and and there's like 14 within a day there's 14 articles written angry furious articles calling for him to be fired there's a petition out there you know he shouldn't he shouldn't be employed by the wall street journal anymore um because he had the temerity to say there's a double standard in how we look at things like drunk sex right and uh, and that double standard implies that a a woman's uh Agency is the equivalent of a piece of furniture, right? That that she she literally isn't. This is this is the problem with the rhetoric, uh, the, with feminist rhetoric, especially around this, is that it, it 
presumes that a woman has no agency, that she's an object, that sex is something that men do to women and that women have done to them. And, I mean, these are s sort of the, the things that they're supposed to be uh, changing, that they, they claim <coughs> that they want to change. But when you look at everything they write, uh, it seems like they can't let it go. Right? The only reason why in that situation where two equally drunk people make the exact same decision that turns one into a rapist and the other into a victim is to basically say that men have agency and women do not. That men do things and women are acted upon. <coughs> you know, so, I mean, and, and you just, you can't even discuss it with these people because, you know, all of a sudden they're calling for you to be fired. And so you're talking about, um, you know, sort of feeling like there's a dangerous <coughs> hysteria around rape. Um, and, you know, if you talk to a lot of people that are, you know, in the sexual assault prevention um, business, I guess, for lack of a better term, you know, they'll say, well, you know, most, most there's too little hysteria because most sexual assaults aren't reported and, you know, um, most well, let's you know, let's let's. Just gonna it. What do you think about that? Let's examine why uh, most sexual assaults would not be reported. Right? And I've discussed this uh, in depth. You, on the one hand, you have feminists and and uh, rape victim advocates and and all of these people who I'm sure believe that they are doing. Uh, I'm sure that they believe or that they're well intentioned, right? That they believe that they're doing a good thing. But what do they constantly do? They say things like, only 6% of, of men who are charged with rape are ever convicted, or who are reported to police are ever convicted. Now, this is misleading because they will set these statistics side by side with the conviction rates for other crimes, but the conviction rate is the rate of what cases go to trial end in conviction, right? What they are comparing is the attrition rate for rape to the conviction rate for other crimes and acting. And so, I mean, why would I? And then, and then they talk about how the process of reporting is so grueling and the police will re-victimize you and, and all of it. Like, I wouldn't report if I believed all of that. If I believed that the process was going to be horrible and grueling, the police were going to re-victimize me at trial, I'd, I would be re-victimized again and dragged, have my name dragged through the mud, which isn't allowed, by the way, anymore, but they'll still say it is, and, and have all of it. It's going to be just this horrible, horrible process, and, and he's just going to walk anyway, right? I wouldn't report it, mm -hmm. right? Like, who would? So you're sort of suggesting that it's, it's um, these people who are helping create the culture of fear that make women not want to report? Uh, I, they, they have a big part in creating that culture, and frankly, this whole idea that even nice guys will rape, right? Now, if, if I was a woman who'd been raped, and my rapist, and these, these guys are usually recidivists, and they usually are very, very good at manipulating the woman to not report, emotionally manipulating her to self-blame or to feel sorry for him, um, and he told me, He's just a nice guy who made one mistake, but he's going to move on and be a better person because of it. And then you have all of this other BS with how it's going to be this horrible process and he's just going to get away with it anyway. And then you think, well, but if he is really a nice guy and he seems like a nice guy, and I hear all the time that nice guys do this and they make mistakes and they just don't understand consent, right? And is it is it really worth ruining his going through all of that to ruin his life when he says he's going to go on and never do it again, right? Yeah. Like, okay, now, if I, if I knew that 90% of the time he's done it before and will again to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And if there was anybody actually sort of uh, placing any sense of social responsibility on, on women who've been victimized to actually report it, right? That it's not just you, right? He's going to do it again you need to speak up, even if it's only to get a rape kit done and have it on file and, and leave his name with the police if you know it, even if you don't want to take it any further, 
right? The next woman who reports the guy, they're going to have all of that. His name's already in the system and his DNA, right? And they'll be more likely to take it seriously, right? If, if we could just, but what we have are all of these myths circulating about uh, sexual violence and, and it seems like all of them, you know, if you report, you won't be believed, blah, 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 you know, and none of that's necessarily the case. It seems like the moment that uh, police have to, and they have to do this, they have to do this with every crime, test the veracity of the claim. Right. If you uh, insurance companies do this too, if you claim that your great big huge expensive TV was stolen and you want your homeowner's insurance or your your contents insurance to cover it, you have to prove that you actually owned it first. Right. I mean, you have to prove the veracity of your claim, and the idea is is that actually having to prove the guy did it um, is is some kind of uh, a oppression of women. I've heard some feminists say that the burden of proof in, in rape cases should be reversed, that the man should have to prove consent rather than the woman having or the, the prosecution having to prove a lack of it. You know, like, they, they literally want the justice system turned upside down and inside out just regarding this one crime that they see as male perpetrated on female, even though it's really not gendered in that way. Mm -hmm. And see, so you had, you'd written on your website, you'd written about an attempted sexual assault that happened to you when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. and did, did, did you end up reporting that? Uh, no, I didn't, actually. If I knew then what I know now, I probably would have. Um, part of the reason that I didn't report was that I didn't want my father to go to prison for murder. Uh. <laughs> and, and that would have been a likely outcome. So, you know, I, I, and yet, yet at the same time, we're told that our culture completely and totally accepts sexual violence against women, even though, you know, even though the majority of the men lynched you know, up to the 1930s and 40s in the U.S., were accused of sexual violence. But but we are a to we're a, we're a society that's always been totally okay with rape, right? The crime that that they've they've done surveys, you know, of men. What would you what would you least what crime would you least want to be accused of ever? Right, robbery, murder, or rape? And most of them answer rape because it's disgusting to them. And to be accused of that is something that would just feel really horrible to them, right? And, uh, and then you have, like, vigilante, justice vigilante attacks, right? On, uh, there was one boy, I think, in the UK who was falsely accused, as far as we can tell, of rape when he was 15 or 16. And he had the ever-loving crap beat out of him by a 40-year-old man while he was del delivering his papers, just on the accusation. Right? I mean, like, yet we as a culture, they're trying to tell us that we as a culture are tolerant of rape. It, it just doesn't fit reality. We're a culture that, it, that doesn't even tolerate talking about rape in... in in an incorrect way. So what are some things you would like to see, you would like to see changed? Um, I would like to see the definition of rape actually reflect all victims and all, all perpetrators. Um, I, I especially think that, that the way the definition is now, that it requires penetration, there are a lot of lesbians getting away with sexual violence or not being counted in the statistics. Um, because of that, and uh, nobody seems to really want to address uh, the those female victims because it would require acknowledging a female perpetrator. Um, I would love to see um, the Duluth model of, of domestic violence uh, be thrown in the trash. It's a data... Im uh, Dr. Don Dutton has called it a data impervious paradigm. It is uh, impervious to evidence. It, it 
It uh, actually, uh, the Duluth model describes the rarest form of domestic violence that, that exists, and it is the model that we use. Uh, it's the model that they use to uh, to write the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, it's the model that all of the police departments use and the victim services and better treatment programs use. It's the most mo widely used model in the world. And it describes uh, the, mi the absolute minority, the smallest uh, percentage of cases of any. So I'd like to see that scrapped. I'd like to see... Uh, not just laws being equalized um, and policies being equalized, but I would like to see there be a real effort on the part of uh, police departments when they're training uh, training their staff to resist their natural inclination to let women off the hook and to uh, arrest the man uh, just for ex the sake of expedience, right? Um, I, I would like to see a lot of things change. So, so um, when it comes to, um, to to drunk sex, because I know this is one of the real contentious things. Yeah. What do you think would be a good definition, a good way to determine when sexual assault did or didn't happen? Um, you know, I don't know that there's a good way. Um, somebody can be blackout drunk and uh, and be walking around and talking and you know, making decisions and doing stuff, and you, nobody has any way of knowing whether they're going to remember what happened in the morning, remember that they consented, or whether they're not. Um, you know, so, you know, the whole, the whole thing with alcohol being involved, um, makes it a really, really thorny issue, right? A, a hugely thorny issue, and the fact that it's in a hook, hookup culture, uh, and they've done studies, uh, about casual sex and the differing uh, attitudes toward it uh, from, you know, based you know, men, between men and women. 80% of men who've engaged in a one night stand saw it as a positive experience, and only 40% of women did. Right? And when you have that kind of disparity um, between how one feels the next day, right, and then you mix in a whole ton of alcohol things get awfully complicated, right? So, you know, I don't, I don't know whether there's a good way. I'm sure there's got to be a better way than we deal with it now, but, you know, where it's automatically the man is a rapist and the woman is a victim. But, you know, I don't know whether there, there's a good way to deal with something, with a crime that occurs in private without witnesses most of the time, that involves alcohol that can... Uh, that can seriously mess with people's memories of events and and where the sole determining factor that a crime has committed has been committed is the state of mind of the individuals at the time right their their internal state of mind that's that's the only thing otherwise it would be a perfectly legal act that people engage in you know every day by the millions across the world right the only thing that makes it an illegal act is a woman's lack of consent and a man's awareness of her lack of consent, right? And when you throw, you throw the regret disparity in there and you throw a lot of alcohol in there, I just don't know whether there's an easy way to, to sort things out at all. I certainly think, though, that we shouldn't actually, you know, keep diminishing and eroding uh, due process rights for the accused. Um, you know, I don't think universities should be able to kick a man out on a preponderance of the evidence standard. Uh -huh. You know, like we, we, I mean, the, the whole point of it being really difficult to figure out what happened means we should be extra stringent about making sure we don't screw up and send an innocent person to prison, right? It, it, we shouldn't be making it easier to send an innocent person to prison just because it's difficult to sort out what happened. And you know, and some people would say, well, you know, a woman, why would a woman report, you know, a rape in a, in a situation where she didn't remember what happened? Why, why do you think that would be the case? 
Um, well, okay, so here's the thing. I mean, like, everybody's like, why would a woman do that? Why would a woman... Women do that, women do that for lots of reasons. I mean, not all women, a small percentage of women, right, will do that. They, they, uh, the, uh, accuser in the, in the Hofstra, uh, false rape accusation, uh, she accused those boys of young men of rape because... And this, this is the funny part, they, you know, she was drunk at a party as she got separated from her boyfriend, uh, they, they lost track of each other. She went up to those young men and propositioned them, and they went into the men's room and had sex. One of them who had a girlfriend and so he, he didn't want to uh, participate, uh, filmed it on his cell phone, thank God, or they'd all be in prison. And... Uh, she instigated it, right? She uh, was filmed encouraging them, right, to continue. And then when she shows up with the, carrying her shoes all, all bedraggled, right, at her dorm room to find her boyfriend there waiting for her worried sick, right, where have you been? She said, oh, I was just raped. And then he talked her into, of course, uh, because he's a good man, right, talked her into reporting it. Right? And then once she'd reported it, there was no going back. Otherwise, her boyfriend would find out that she cheated on him, and everybody would probably find out that she'd had sex with like three or four men in a public restroom. Right? And she didn't want anybody to find that out about her. Right? It was less embarrassing to accuse them of rape than it would be to own her own decisions. So... I mean, this this would be why. Uh, praise Martin Oguike, um, in his case, and he lost his, he, I think he was expelled, he lost his foot, he was at least dropped from the, the college football team, lost his scholarship. Um, and then the grand jury finally was just like, there's nothing here, uh, and the one of the reasons that there's nothing here is because we have texts, basically, between the the accuser and her friends saying that she's going to accuse him of rape because she's not going to have a hookup with yet another football player uh, that doesn't end in a relationship because she's getting a reputation as a football slut, right? So to save her reputation, she, she, she accused him of rape, ruined his life, ruined his football career, right? Um, you know, women, some women will do this. Right, they have they have plenty. There are plenty of reasons for women to 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 do it. I mean, even in the UK, I think you get ten thousand pounds in victims' compensation for making an accusation. Just for making an accusation. As far as I know. Um. Okay. Are there any other um, anything else I haven't asked you that seems seems obvious to talk about. Let's see, what, one question. Do you think, uh, so you got, you got involved in the, the men's rights movement, what, a couple of years ago? Um, like yeah, like the, a, a couple of years ago was sort of when I really started to, to get, you know, heavily involved, yeah. And how would you, how would you say that it's changed? Has it grown? Has it stayed the same size? Has it gotten smaller? Oh, it's, it's gotten way bigger. Um, I think, uh, like, because the men's movement has been around for quite a long time, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one of the things, and you'll see this too, um, you know, mainstream media doesn't want to touch a lot of these issues. I mean, and no wonder, look, you know, again, James Taranto and, you know, people are calling for his head. They don't want to touch these issues. Um, and uh, so it, it wasn't until... Like, nobody even, a lot of people didn't, weren't even aware that there were men's activists out there until the internet, right? Because then you have a platform for spreading information and, uh, you know, sort of an alternative media that doesn't have its hands tied uh, because they uh, depend on advertisers and they depend on, um, you know, readers to pay for subscriptions and things like that, right? Okay. That... Uh, now you have this huge, huge growing awareness because the internet is essentially lawless and 
and it's a you know you can be impervious to public opinion and uh, and still say what you want to say on the internet um, so it's it's been growing and growing and growing since uh, people started to come online on mass right uh -huh. and uh, and it will continue to grow I'm sure um, and you even see uh, you'll even see in articles online when even just regular people um, feel that the author is, you know, full of bullshit about the issue. They will come on and they will say some very, very pro-male things. They've never even heard of the men's rights movement, maybe, but they will come on and, and actually say, no, 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 you're wrong. I can't believe you just said that. Um, you know, like, so there's, there's a lot of sort of people in general becoming more aware of some of these problems they've had fathers or husbands or sons or brothers who have been uh, been chewed up and spit out by the system and so you know they're experiencing it more in in their daily lives and maybe you're just sort of getting an awareness just from that and a lot of those people when they stumble on us they they uh, stick around so yeah mm -hmm. Okay, and um, and Karen, where um, where are you located, and uh, and what do you do outside of this? Oh, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, I work uh, part time as uh, a waitress. Actually, um, I have three kids, and uh, and I have some erotic fiction published that earns a little bit of extra money for me too. So, um, kind of, I've I've got a lot of things going. So. Okay. And um, how old are you? Uh, forty-three. Forty-three. So sons, daughters. Uh, two sons, uh, eight, uh, nineteen and eleven, and a daughter who's eighteen. Um. Okay. Great. Well, those are actually all the questions I had for you. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Anything that seems important? Uh, no, I think I think we're probably good. I mean, if we're if we're sort of confined to uh, to sexual violence, you know, it's the topic's yeah. pretty much talked out. So, okay. Well, if there's anything that you think of, um, please uh, just shoot me an email and let me know. All right, we'll do. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye.